Good morning. Happy Sunday morning. The sun is out, 60s and 70 degrees for another few days, right? Maybe we'll pray and ask God to have this all summer. Who's with me on that? I know some people are ready for 100 degrees, but that's okay. That's okay. Turn with me in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1. We're going to be in Hebrews 1 through 4 this morning. And just be warned, I warned the first service, I wrote this sermon twice this week. Got up this morning at 6 a.m. and God says, I have something very specific for you to do today. I want you to read through my word. Chapters 1 through 4. And we'll be talking about it as we go through it. I also did something I'm going to ask you to pray for. I posted on social media this morning. Probably some of my pastor friends and churches may or may not be excited about it. I said this. I said this. I said probably what we can do, what I recommend doing, the church in America today should do this. Fire their pastor, fire their board, and put Jesus back on the throne again. Amen. Put Jesus back in charge and say, God, you, he, he promised he's going to build his church. He's in charge and we're going to do whatever. So be praying for me. I'm sure I'm sure I'm going to have a few pastor friends reaching out this week and say, what in the world are you talking about? And I said, I would be happy to share. God is good. He is good. I woke up last Friday morning. And this one thing on my heart was peace and standing firm in trust and believing what God was doing, didn't know yet. Friday morning, it was like, Larry, get ready. I want you guys to have a worship, revival worship, outdoors where everybody can join in and get this. And we haven't asked for permission yet, so we need to ask. There's three churches that have already said that they're in here in Cabot to do worship outdoors in the Atwoods parking lot. So be praying. We're actually going to put a date out there. We're going to have a like a band on a, on a tractor trailer, hopefully some food, and just hang out, make it fun. But we're going to go worship outside. And three of our churches have already said we're in, in the Cabot area. So be praying for this, number one. That was Friday. And I said, all right, God, I'm going to be obedient. Saturday I woke up. And Saturday it was clear as day. It's, it was, Larry, it's time to write down Put it on paper, this discipleship process that you've been using for the last eight years. It's what Jesus modeled for us. So it's, it's not mine, it's his. He said, put it on paper and make it, make it available. So by the end of Saturday, I've got it all written down. It's a very simple framework. We, we put this thing out called Give Them Heaven. Who has seen it already? GiveThemHeaven.org. And I had a few friends go, Larry, what in the world is that? And I'm like, that's just telling people about Jesus. Well, guess what's happened since then? This simple discipleship framework, one on three, like one person discipling three people. I've been doing it over the last two months here. I've done it everywhere I've ever been. We will all be doing it eventually. 20 different countries and four different languages have downloaded this. Give them heaven. Make disciples of Jesus Christ. Praise God, right? 700 people have downloaded this. And I've got like four other languages, new languages, we're going to do this week. And pastors all over the country are saying, hey, can I start doing this in my church? And I'm like, please, like, that's what we're, that's, like, it's about making disciples. So be in prayer for that. Be in prayer for the worship revival. If you know Atwoods or the people that own Atwoods, let them know. Say, please say yes, because we're praying, right? If not, we'll pick a different place, all right? God knows where we're going to be. Hebrews 1. We're going to do a little bit different today. I'm just reading straight in God's Word, and we're always in God's Word. But I'm just trying to be obedient to what God's asked to do, so follow along with me. Hebrews 1 starts, it says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through him, through whom also he created the world. He, talking about Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by his word and his power. Think about that for a moment. Christ 
is the radiance of God's glory, and he is made in the exact imprint of God, fully God, fully man. Jesus said this, listen, Jesus said this, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. For all of us who are asking God, like, make yourself real, like, I want to see you, I want to know you, he sent his son already for us. If you were back in that time, you could wrap your arms around him, the God of the universe. He was sent. He was glorious, full of God's radiance, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he died for our sins. He rose again. Then he ascended into heaven And he sat down at the right hand of God, the word calls it the majesty on high, having become a much superior to angels. This is the book in Hebrews that talks about Jesus is greater than even the angels as the name he is much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, Today I have begotten you, I have made you, I have given you, for again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Here's why this is important to us. And you won't find this in any other religion on this planet. That the God of the universe, the creator, is our father. He is like all relational. He loves you. He's trying to say, I have sent my son, a loving father, has sent his own son, his family. He loves him. He sent him for us, for you. He loves you more than anything. And it's mind-blowing because you're like, who's ever thought this? God is so big. Surely he doesn't like take time for me. Like, who's ever thought that? God is so big, surely he's not worried about, like me, like my stresses, my, right, my desires, my, like he actually loves the things that you desire. He loves to even take those desires and and continually point them more towards him and what he made you for. He loves everything about you. Our Father God I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. He's talking about Jesus, but don't miss this. He's talking about his son sent for us, for his sons and daughters. For you. For you. Let all of God's angels worship him. This is a cool picture. If you've ever read in Revelation, it talks about when we go to heaven or when it talks about when one of us are baptized or accept Christ as our son, that what? That heaven erupts in worship. Could you imagine? Like heaven erupts in worship. I don't know how many angels there are. Like thousands and thousands. I don't know how many people are in heaven at this moment. Trillions and trillions, right? But heaven erupts in worship. I mean, I wonder who declares that. Is it the Lord himself? Is it the angel Gabriel? Is it the Holy Spirit confirming there as well as here? Scripture doesn't say. All it says is when one of us actually come into relationship with him, heaven erupts in worship. Complete love, complete acceptance. Let all of God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, He makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. That fire is a perfecting fire. Think of it as a, a thought of a purification process. When we think of fire, we think of something that's hot and it could be destructive. And in a sense it is. It is meant to describe this destroying everything in you and me on this earth that are not of God. All of it. And sometimes it's painful. Like who's ever walked through a fire, through a trial, through a storm? So painful, it's what? It's either one of two things. It's humbling or we harden our heart with it. I'll keep going because that's a whole other sermon. 
but of but of the Son, but of Jesus, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprighteous and the scepter of your kingdom, you have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond companion. In verse 10, it continues. This is 1 verse 10. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of your earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up. It's talking about the power of God, how big he is. He will roll this earth. Have you guys heard this before? The new earth and the new heaven? What You've heard that in Scripture, right? In Revelation, it talks about after Jesus comes and he defeats the enemy once and for all, sends the evil one and all of the dark forces to hell, completely to hell. Hell is a real place, guys, right? Because it's got to be completely absent and apart from God because he is all righteous. He is holy. Nothing, even us, when we choose to go our own way, right? That has to be apart from God. He's going to, when Jesus comes back, and this is, I don't know, you guys might have heard this. This is Tattooed Jesus. Who's ever heard of Tattooed Jesus? King of kings and Lord of lords written on his thigh is what Revelation says. Now, there's controversy. Is that actually a tattoo, Larry, or is that like a stamp on his robe? Okay, we'll let you guys figure that out when you get to heaven. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let that settle the debate. But he comes back and settles the score and resets the clock back to what it was supposed to be in a new earth and a new heaven are made. In that moment, he rolls this current heaven and this current earth up like a robe. Verse 2, chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard lest we drift away from it. This is the one warning I've seen. I, as I told you guys, I used to read the book of Revelations a ton when I was a teenager. And it said like, what, a fourth of the people will turn away from him? It even says this, a fourth of believers, of people who have faith will turn away, and even in that time. And it's mind-blowing. Because it's like, how in the world, Lord, could we turn away from you? Because just like King Solomon, you guys know this, right, about the, about the King Solomon? At the end of his life, he had everything. He had all the riches. He had all the power. He had a ton of wives, I think. He had everything he could ever want, and he turned away from the Lord. Like in Ecclesiastes, he says something like this. Life is just, it's just but a mist. Like, who, who could know what it's about? Like, The Lord actually let Solomon harden his heart and his mind to the point where he he let him turn himself over to everything of this world instead of God. I think it's for us to see this truly can happen even to those of us who love him with everything. That's why it says work out your faith and fear and trembling. So let me keep going. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just just retribution, a consequence, Christ came, he died, he actually came in our place and died for those consequences. How shall we escape if we neglect Such a great salvation. Basically, God's trying to, and we don't know who the author is of Hebrews. We know it was written in 68 AD. They think it was Paul. They think it might actually have been a couple of different writers that were inspired by the Holy Spirit. But the point is this. These are people, these are men and women, who actually, in their lifetime, got to either see firsthand or know people that did see Christ walking the earth being put on the cross and then resurrected. Thousands of people saw the resurrected Christ. 
with even the nail holes in his, it's actually here in your wrist where your tendon and bones are is where they nailed him to the cross. They actually got to see these things. And even though they saw in person, which with you and I sometimes wish that we could see with our own eyes, it would be so much easier to believe. Even though they saw, they were still turning away from Christ is the only way. Does that sound like the American church today? Like, even back then it was, your works will save you. Like, you living, like, perfectly according to the Ten Commandments will save you. Like, they kept going back to this old religion, this man-made religion. Like, forgive me, but I'm going to say it. All the denominations on our earth, like, why are there so many denominations on this earth when there's only one Christianity? Because denominations are man-made religion. They're a way to interpret, to say, this is how we get to the Father. And I'm not condemning them. I grew up, you guys know this, right? I grew up Catholic, Baptist, and then Assembly of God. So I got this swirly of all three. And like, somehow I came out of that going, God, I believe your word. And I believe that your son came for me, for us. And I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow him. I'm going to follow your word. And praise God, more and more, the denominations are just focusing on Jesus and they're focusing on the word. I got on a soapbox there. Chapter 2, verse 3. How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, if we neglect the fact that Jesus died for you and me, and that is the only way we get to go to heaven? Like he said it himself, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. No one comes to the Father except through me. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere. What is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you care for him? Like, why in the world? Like, who are we that God loves us, right? Like, God is enormous. How in the world can he care about my, like, my, my life, really? This dude born in Galveston, Texas, like, you know, watching the chemical plants light burn at night, thinking that was the most beautiful thing on the earth, right? Standing out in my front yard. Like, how in the world, how in the world can that big God care so much about you and me? Who is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than angels. He sent Jesus to this earth is what it's talking about. You have crowned him with glory and with honor, putting everything of subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside of his control. Christ is actually controlling everything through the Holy Spirit because of God's will. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. We're still waiting. You guys know this, right? Like we are still waiting for this world, this earth, to be completely remade. Like, who, who knows that sin and evil is still let loose all over our world, right? We can see that. We can feel it sometimes, even in our own flesh. There's a reason why we still battle sometimes the, what, the temptations of the flesh versus being led by the Spirit, because we have a choice. And that is what it means to like actually die to self, let that let the part of this fallen world that, that scripture calls our flesh, right? Let that part die to ourself. God, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours. I'm gonna jump down to verse 13. And right before that, he says, I will tell of your name 
to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, and here's the, one of the main points, I will put my trust in him. I will put my trust in him. Man, if we haven't learned anything else, right? You guys know this is this is the main lesson. This is one of the this is one of the major points in our lives through all of it. Who's been tested this year? Just a little bit, right? Who's had their faith tested to the point of you're like, God, are you even real? Like, do you even care about what's going on in my life right now? Like, I thought your word says that, right? You're going to come down and fight our battles, and you're going to come and right all the wrongs, and you're, like, why, why do the people I love, why are, why are they fighting cancer, right? Why, God, is this person still in so much pain and to- turmoil? God, why, why do we have so much strife at our jobs, right? Are we the only one? Is that just the church, or is that outside out here too, right? Like, why is that? Because this world has not been made new yet. And he is giving us, he is giving us a choice to say, Father God, I'm going to trust you. Even in this, I'm going to trust you. Moms and dads, and I don't care how old your kids are, but it's a test constantly to say, God, I'm going to trust you with my kids, is it not? I'm going to trust you with my sons and my daughters. Like, Father, I'm going to trust your will that you are actually going to keep your word, that you're going to fight our battles, you're going to right every wrong. And like, if you're not, just tell me, because I'll jump in and fix it, okay? Like, who's with me on that? But seriously, he's like, I'm, don't, just trust me. Just trust me. Even when cancer ravages their entire life and takes them from this earth, Trust me, I promise you, in the end, I will show you that was not for nothing. I will show you how big I am, how I'm using that, and our human minds do not get that. Trust me, when that spouse walks away from the marriage, right? And man, talk about everything in your flesh and your heart's breaking like you, you want to do something. And God says, even in this, you can trust me. That's the test. I will put my trust in him. Let me ask you just from me to you personally, have you actually like said, I am done trying to like control this life by myself and I'm trusting him. I'm trusting him in this. Believe me, I've been there this last 10 months. You guys got to hear a little bit about it if y'all hung out like after our second service a couple weeks ago. I mean, we've had to trust him in obedience just to say, God, you know what you're doing. You know what you're doing. And even though we don't understand, I still get up in the mornings and get on my knees and say, Father God, I trust you. I trust you. And you don't know me anything. But I owe you everything. And I'm going to give you every part of my my life. I'm going to give you the stuff that I've been holding out on. I'm going to give you even this. Is this you? The shame and the guilt that we carry from the decisions and mistakes that we've made, whether right now or last week or 10 years ago, it doesn't matter. You can trust him even with that. He says, I love you no matter what. Don't carry that stuff anymore. Just trust me and follow me. And then again, he says, behold, I and the children God has given me. We trust you. Man, here's, let me share something with you. I never thought I'd hear these words. I would hoped I'd hear these words from my son, from my daughter. I've, we've been in ministry for 20-something years now, 18 full-time, and then many more before that part-time volunteer. I would never thought I'd hear these words, and I've been praying constantly. 
those of us that are in ministry, we always wonder and worry and pray for our kids, don't we? Because we're like, oh, Lord, they're going to they're gonna run from ministry because it's been hard. Like you guys know. And my son, even over the past events of the last two weeks, my son said these words. He, he's signing up for the Coast Guard tomorrow. He's swearing in. I don't know if it, I don't know what time it is, but you guys pray for him. He's swearing in. And then May 11th, he's, he's shipping out. Yeah, May, May 11th, he's shipping out. But then he says this. He says, Dad, I want to go to, I think I want to go to seminary. He said, I think, he says, I think I want to be, I want to invest in men's lives when I get out of the Coast Guard. I want to be a men's pastor. And man, talk about and answer the prayer. This is my prayer for every man in this room. I hope you know that. Every man in this room, I pray that God gets a hold of you and says God wants to use, he wants to use you to pour into other men. And it's between you and him what, what you do for his kingdom and his ministry. It took a man to grab me and take me to the mountains and say, God made you to make an impact on this planet. It's your time. And gosh, I'm scared to death to talk in front of people. Do you guys know that? Thankfully, it's gotten easier over the last four years. But when I saw God changing lives through the word, like I'm like, I'm in. And he wasn't making these wimpy, passive men. Like he was making bold men who are willing to lay it all on the line and say, I, I will do whatever you call me to do, Father. Amen. I pray that for our women. I pray God get, let you know you have everything you already need to be a bold, loving woman who makes an impact in your home, in this community, and just trust him what he has for you. Don't let anything hold you back from being who God made you to be. There's nothing special about us who do this thing called church the only thing that it is, is we're obedient and we always say yes. That's it. When God says, here's your next step, we're like, all right, I'll do it. Here's your next step, I'll do it. With or without a job from a church officially, so I'm finding out, right? We're going to do it because that's what God says, be faithful. I'm so excited, pray for Blake. Pray for him. I've prayed for him, our kids, for years. But just know I'm praying that same prayer for you. I mean it. Every man and woman in this room who has spent time in the Word that's hearing that it actually is, Christ is serious when he says, go therefore and make disciples. He's talking about you. He's talking about you. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself Likewise, partook of the same things through the death might destroy the one who has the power of the death, that is, the devil. Christ came and took on the flesh because he had to destroy the flesh because the evil one, it's saying, has control over that and deliver all those who, through fear of death, were subject to lifelong slavery, to sin, to the evil one, to temptation, for surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. He helps you and me, his people, his sons and his daughters. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every aspect. It's talking again about Christ so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins. Propitiation means he can exchange, he can take your place to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, Christ has also been tempted. Let me, let me just let you men and women know, when we are tempted, temptation itself is not a sin. Like it's not. And by the way, we all sin. Like who, who wants to like, we have all sinned, like everyone sins, everyone on this planet for all have, right, fallen short of the glory of God. Stop beating yourself up with it. 
There's no perfect person on this earth, not one. The only one was Christ, and he walked on this earth as man. That's what that's all this is trying to say. He knows what you and I battle because he's done it. In chapter 3, it begins again. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in the heavenly calling, and this is what I was just basically challenging you guys with, consider Jesus the apostle, a high priest of our confession. He's taken our place. When we say essentially Christ or God forgive me, and we believe that Christ died for our sins, that's what it's talking about. He was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all of God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more than Moses, and much more glory as the builder of the house has more honor for the house itself. It's basically saying, guys, all those temples that we construct, all the churches that you see in our towns that are constructed to just praise God and inhabit us, he's saying, these buildings don't mean a thing. Like he's saying, you, you mean everything. And Christ in you is actually what we're here to, to proclaim, to say, he's the only one that we should be worshiping. Praise God. And that you and I have this choice to say, God, like, I don't want to, I want to live a life worthy of you and your son. I need you. Chapter 3, verse 7, it continues, it says, and we're getting to the main point, and I'll get to a conclusion. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, listen to these words, if you hear his voice, if you hear God's voice, if you hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit, do not harden your heart as in the rebellion on the day of the testing in the wilderness. Do not be careful, and this is the warning, be careful not to harden your heart during the trial. Man, be careful not to harden your heart when you're hurt. Be careful not to harden your heart when, when we're battling cancer. These trials, these fires, these diseases, this fallen world, like even when spouses leave us or betray us, like we have two choices to make. And yes, grief, grief has all kinds of emotion in it, right? Anger, denial. I, gotta, I don't know all of them because I'm still in the middle of grieving, right? So, but it has all of them and we have a choice. We could either humble ourselves and say, God, I'm not in control. I can't fix this. But you can. Or, here's the second part, and it's scary. We can humble ourselves, or we start to harden our hearts. We start to harden our hearts. And he's talking to those of us that have allowed our hearts to be hardened, and it's a little bit of a warning. So today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart against him, against others, like even if they hurt you. He says, forgive them. Forgive them. He even says what? Love them. Wow. Love that dude who just took five grand out of your bank account. I was like, God, I'll love him after I chase him down and get it back, right? That's how we feel. Do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness. You will all be tested just like Christ was where your fathers put me to, re to test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. He's talking about the Israelites that were lost in the wilderness for 40 years, the people that were with Moses, and they were complaining and grumbling. It sounds a lot like 2023, doesn't it? Post-pandemic. Sounds a lot like me sometimes, if I'm not careful. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, and this is God, because he hates sin, they shall not enter my rest. And that's the warning. That's the warning. When we are 
unforgiving, when we hang on to the things of our flesh, when we don't release others to God. And believe me, like even me, I've got one family member. I'm just going to be real with you for a second. Every day I go, I say it out loud sometimes, God, I've forgiven them. I give them to you. Every day. God, I've forgiven them. I give that to you again. Like, God, I forgive them for, right? It's just constant, like, God, I don't want my heart to be hardened. It's scary when we allow our hearts to harden because we can't hear Him. We can't hear His Spirit. So I'll wrap up with this. We didn't get to verse chapter 4, so you guys are you guys need to do that yourself Hebrews chapter 4 He made you He is your Father God He knows you personally and He's saying, I've got something for you to do Scripture keeps saying it, I don't know if you're catching it it says in these last days last days and we can feel it like we can feel time ticking we can feel like my time's limited on this earth and believe me I want to have just as much fun as you do I wish I had a car and was racing with Randy out in the streets like I do Randy I'll be able to afford one one day bro I'll sell all my wife's horses I'll be able to do that but seriously Christ says, I want you to live life and live it to the full. And I want you to tell people about my Father. I think this could be incredible. But don't let a heart to heart get in your way. Don't let this fallen world that seems to take us out with very specific trials and storms don't let those things take you out or distract you from what God made you to do. Here's what, here's what this, this whole sermon said by reading Hebrews 1 through 3. Because we can trust Him. Because we can trust Him. Stand with me and we'll pray together. We'll have a moment of communion right after. There's one thing I know. I can I can make a promise to you right now, and I know he will fulfill. You can trust him. You can trust him. I promise you, he has your best interest in mind. And when you finally say, God, I'm giving you my everything, you have every area of my life. Please tell me what to do next. Please show me what you want me to do with my job. Show me how you want me to be at home with my family, with my friends, with my kids. Like, dig into this. He will change your everything. And then he is going to blow your mind because he's saying, all right, are you ready? Let's pray. Father God, we trust you. We give you our everything. Father, we ask that you take our past and you redeem it. Father, we confess it to you. We give it to you. Father, take any shame or guilt or unforgiveness or anything that's keeping us from walking completely in you, in your presence. I thank you for your son. I thank you that he died for us. Thank you that it's never too late for us to turn towards you. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. So at our church, we, we have a time where we take communion. There's communion stations all around the room. We have a time of response. 
I just want to say, take a moment just between you and God and say, Father God, I give you this thing that I've been holding on to that I've not trusted you. And I'm not going to let this world distract me anymore. You've got my full attention. 